Good morning. Welcome. My name is Callum Jones. I serve as the senior pastor at Trinity. And as we begin our service, let's celebrate Jesus' victory. He is King. Let us rejoice in Him. Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. His kingdom cannot fail, he rules over earth and hell. The keys of death and hell are to our Jesus give. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again. I say rejoice, rejoice in glorious hope, our Lord the Judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say rejoice. Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 declare, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. As Christians, we celebrate Christ's victory over sin and death. Jesus was crucified for our sins, died, buried, and on the third day rose from the dead. And for 40 days he met with his disciples, teaching them, encouraging them, and preparing them to continue his mission in the world. But his victory over sin and death is signified by the position he fills now. He is the risen Lord, and He is the exalted Lord. He is seated at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, above all other powers, authorities, rulers, dominions, and government. The exaltation of Jesus to His position is glorious and is at the heart of Christian faith. Today is Ascension Sunday the Sunday immediately following Ascension Day, last Thursday, when we remember that Jesus returned to his supreme position in eternity, the glorious Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. We welcome you today, young and old, newcomer or worshipper of many years, to join with us as we celebrate the risen and exalted Lord, the Lord who has ascended on high, the triumphant Lord, superior above all things in this time, in eternity, in this place, and throughout creation. Let us pray with hope, thankfulness, and assurance of faith. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is none like you. 
You alone are God, the eternal living one, the source of all life, the giver of love, the redeemer of our souls, the victorious and risen Lord, the triumphant everlasting King of kings. Humbly, we bow before you in grateful praise and thanks. And gladly, we call upon you to lift our hearts, our minds, our eyes, our lives in worship. Fill us, O Lord, and bring us to the place in this next hour where we say and know that you and you alone are the one who changes us, renews us, strengthens us, softens us, moves us, empowers us, and sends us so that we may enter our week ready to do your will and quick to announce your glory and love. For we ask this in the name of the risen and exalted King, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Majesty Worship is majesty Unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. So exalt, lift up on high the name of Jesus. Jesus the King Majesty Worship His Majesty Jesus who died Now glorified King of all kings Majesty Worship His Majesty Unto Jesus honor and praise majesty kingdom authority flow from his throne unto his own his anthem raise so exalt lift up on high the name of Jesus Jesus the King Majesty Worship His Majesty Jesus who died Now glorified King of all kings Jesus who died Now glorified King of all kings fills the night it cannot hide the light whom shall I fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still whom shall I fear I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever 
He is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me. Yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. And nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your Says you are faithful, you are faithful, and nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hands. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. Before me, I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies. Is always by my side. Throughout the New Testament, early Christian believers called one another sister and brother. Even more than with their natural families, their relationship with God meant they were joined to other believers in Christ by the Holy Spirit in an even deeper bond. A bond that lasts in this life and forevermore in eternal life with Jesus. To greet one another in those first decades of the church meant something very meaningful. No other belief in those days had such a bond. We know today that we cannot easily meet face to face. But we are committed to the bond we have in Jesus. So let's take a few minutes to greet one another. And perhaps we can surprise one another. If you have a cell phone, why not send a greeting by text or email to someone else in the church right now? And we can bless one another by reaching out with a greeting across the internet. And if you do not have a cell phone or your cell phone isn't immediately available, greet those with you. Or if you are by yourself, perhaps call someone today, greet them, and extend God's blessing to them. We love to celebrate birthdays. Usually we would invite people to raise their hand if they had a birthday during this week. So, as strange as it may seem, if you've had a birthday, why not raise your hand right now? And let me pray for you. Lord, thank you for these dear family, friends and newcomers to our services who are celebrating a birthday. May they know your love and presence. Encourage them. Fill them with your grace and spill your tender love upon them. In the name of Jesus, amen. 
and please let us know so we can celebrate with you. Now is the time in our service for our tithes and offerings. I'd like to share a story about a gift given to me. This gift is one of the best gifts given to me and one of the most memorable. One Christmas, a number of years ago, the gift was inside a big, heavy cardboard box wrapped in lots of wrapping paper. When it was time to open the gift, my brother and one of my best friends were there. So I got them to help me open the gift. We ripped away all the Christmas wrapping and discovered that it was a foosball table. Immediately, we assembled the table and finally we started playing. Foosball or table soccer has been well used throughout the years in my home. And my wrists have been well used throughout the years. Whenever I'd have my guy friends or other guests over, we'd play foosball. And sometimes the score would go into double digits. Instead of the normal 10 points, the score would be 12-10 or 15-13. Our tithes and our offerings are gifts to God. Our gifts will be used to care for our community, our church family, and reach out with the gospel. God loves an unselfish, cheerful giver. There are a number of ways you can give, as you'll see on the screen, including by mail, online through Canada Helps, and e-transfer. Thank you very much for giving. And thank you, Silas, for praying for our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for a new day. Thank you for the gift of loved ones. Thank you for gathering us here together, virtually. Thank you for being in our midst. Teach us perseverance in this challenging time. Teach us gratitude for every small blessing. Teach us compassion for those suffering neighbors. Teach us love for our struggling friends and family. Thank you for the price Christ paid on the cross. Thank you for the relationship we can have with you. Thank you for the abilities and resources you gave us. Thank you for the opportunities to use them to serve you. Forgive us our sins and failings. Forgive us our disobedience and pride. Help us to forgive those who hurt us. Help us to imitate your beloved Son. Remind us daily of your love, mercy, and compassion. Remind us daily to extend the same love, mercy, and compassion to others, to those within our spiritual family, and to those within your created world. In the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Many of us are connecting through online video and conference calls. I was even allowed to surprise a group last week, appearing on Zoom and briefly saying hi and praying before the group continued their Mandarin Bible study. Our small groups are flourishing. People are discovering Jesus. People are growing in their understanding of the Bible. People are finding friendship and fellowship. And this is exciting. But I know others are lonely, struggling, 
and unwell. We want to pray for you. If your group meets, why not let the church office know when you meet and the video conferencing details? You never know, you might be visited by a pastor to bring a short greeting. And if you are alone, please let us know. Perhaps we can link you with someone who can reach out to you. Thank you for your continued support for the online baby bottle campaign. Details of how to give your donation are on the screen and in the bulletin. And let us continue to pray for the needy in our city in these days. The pastors and board meet regularly. For over a month we have been looking closely at the BC government's advice on gatherings. We have consulted with other churches and church leaders. And we have reviewed information from various Christian leadership agencies on the appropriate steps forward. Fellowship together is so important for us as Christians. Please pray as the pastors and board consider wise, safe and meaningful ways for us to express our fellowship in the coming weeks. And next week is Pentecost. Usually we hang flags from across the world throughout our church building. We celebrate the rich diversity God has brought us into at Trinity. I invite you to take a few moments in the next couple of days to record a very brief greeting to everyone. It can be as simple as, greetings to all of you, or may the Lord bless you with his Holy Spirit. That's less than five seconds for each. All I ask is we speak slowly and clearly so everyone can hear the recording. We cannot hang flags, but we can hear greetings in many different languages. So let's celebrate Pentecost with these greetings. Email your recording to me or the church office so we can include them in our service. Our email details are on our website, shown at the end of this service, or in our online bulletin. And most of all, may the Lord bless you, hold you, watch over you, guide you, and reveal his everlasting love to you in Jesus Christ. Standing, walking, living in the promises of God, my Savior. Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring, glory in the eyes I will shout and sing. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing, walking, living in the promises of God my Savior. Well, good morning to you, or good afternoon. Now is the time in our service for our children's moment, and a special welcome to all of our children who may be joining us today, and all the families who may be online with us today. So a couple weeks ago, we had a Mother's Day picture, and today I want to share with you a couple of word pictures, or some picture riddles for you. Let's play a bit of a game today. And let's make it a bit of a competition. So kids, you can beat your parents. Or you can just kindly and play fairly with your parents, I should say. So I'm going to show you a bit of a word picture. And let's see who can solve it. Either the kids or the parents. Or you can just play this game with whoever is with you in, in your room. 
or even by yourself. So I'll show you a picture and let's see if you can guess it. Here is the first one. Milon e on. What is this? Well, one is in the million, so it's probably one in a million. Did you get it? Well, I know, kids, it may have been hard for you, but it's okay. We'll give up one point to the parents. Now, this next one will be a bit easier, kids. In fact, I want to give you a bit of a hint. So this hint is just for the kids. Parents, you may need to cover your ears with maybe some Kleenex. So kids, here's the hint for you. Just for you, this is something that you may have eaten this morning. Here it is. Can you guess what this is? You got it. It's scrambled eggs. Now, I think it's tied. The parents got the first one. The kids got the second one, I'm sure. Now, this is a tiebreaker. We've got to have a tiebreaker. This is it. Here it is. The big tiebreaker. It's now or never, kids. You can do it. Guess what this tiebreaker is. It's now or never. Our backs are against the wall. So, can you guess this? Well, as you can see, the I is underneath the stand, so it must be, I understand. Congratulations, kids. I'm sure you answered that last one. So good job on doing that. If not, I'm sure we are good losers, aren't we? Because we play fairly. So go ahead and shake hands with your parents, hug and embrace, oh wait. Yes, you can do that in your own home. And boys and girls, the reason why I want to share this with you today is, is because you are the puzzle. Actually, life is like this puzzle, isn't it? Life is puzzling, life is confusing, but we have the answers in our Bibles, don't we? We have the answers in God. And I hope today, boys and girls, and our families, people joining us today, that we will continue to listen to the sermon and hear the answers in God's word and what God wants to speak to us today through the character of Stephen in the New Testament. So right now, boys and girls, why don't we bow our heads and we will pray and let's give thanks to God for all that he has given us, including all the answers through his word and through himself and what is he is revealed to us. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord God, for each of the children who are joining us today. Thank you, Lord God, for all the parents who are joining us, for the families that are represented. I pray, Lord God, that you would bless each family, and I pray that during this time you would remind them that we have all that we can have and ask or imagine through you. And you give us your answers through your word as we dig deeply in your word. Thank you, Lord, for what you're going to teach us today through your word, through the character of Stephen in the New Testament. And I pray that you would be with Pastor Lee as he speaks to us in a moment. And I pray that our ears and our hearts would be attentive to you. I pray this all in your great name. Amen. Good morning. My name is Lee Baim, and I'm one of the associate pastors here at Trinity. If you don't recognize me from previous weeks, it's probably because I could finally get a haircut this week. It has been so long. Actually, we did have a hairdresser come to our house this week, but I was the only one who did not need a haircut. In any case, it's my privilege and joy to share God's word with you today, long hair or short. Although I have been able to preach many times here at Trinity over the years, this is the first time I have preached primarily to an online congregation. I expect that this is going to feel very different. I really wish I could see your faces, your smiles, and hopefully hear your amens. I wouldn't even mind if I heard a few yawns. 
at least I would know that I'm not alone. But even though it looks like I'm very alone here, you probably realize that I'm not. You aren't able to see this on your screen right now, but there are several people in this sanctuary right now and throughout our filming day that each help us to record our worship services. It's truly a team effort, and we have a great team. So even though it looks like I'm alone, I'm not. Just off to my right, just a little out of your view, is my son Ryan, who records our audio. Behind the camera is our very own Steven Spielberg, better known as Pastor Callum. And around the church property, we often hear our daycare children with their staff, including Maria Forrester. And also you often see our church secretary, Lulu Ye, on our videos. And we've already seen and heard today from our intern, Silas. And the flowers today and each week are brought by Era Portner, who's often here on our filming days setting up. And of course, Pastor Alvin is part of our crew each week with the children's moment and other portions of the service. Also, if you listen to our Mandarin service, you actually, you're not going to hear my voice. You will hear uh, Pastor Doris uh, doing the voiceover in Mandarin. We also often see Alban Carbonilla around the building as he cleans and sanitizes so, so that we can operate in a healthy manner. So this is truly a team effort. Although I look alone, I most certainly am not. Not only do I have this team around me, but I truly sense the support and prayers of you, our church family. And above all, we know that none of us is alone because God is always with us. And if God is not here with me right now, then I might as well shut the camera off right now and leave you all to find another online service. But we know that God is here with you at home and with us here in our church sanctuary. We are not alone. God is with us. He is with each one of us. And as we have been learning lately, God is with us even in our isolation. He was with Hannah when she was picked on. He was with the lepers when they were excluded. He was with Joseph when he was rejected by his own brothers. And he was with Paul in prison. Today, we are looking at another Bible character who was isolated. His name is Stephen. Stephen was isolated because he took a stand, a very unpopular stand. He stood for Jesus. He seemed to stand alone, but as we will see, Jesus stood with him. Before we meet Stephen today in our scripture reading, we need to understand a little of what had happened in his life. Jesus had lived mainly among Jewish people who spoke Aramaic as their first language. But after Jesus had died, and after he had risen from the dead, after 40 more days, Jesus ascended to heaven and was seated at the right hand of the Father in the very center of the throne of heaven, to the position of highest authority in all the universe. Well, what has that to do with Stephen and the first followers of Jesus? You see, soon after Jesus was seated on heaven's throne, he sent the Holy Spirit to empower his followers for their mission, just as he had promised. They, and we, were commissioned to continue his work. The first sign that was given by the Holy Spirit was the ability to share the message of God in many languages. This happened in Jerusalem, when Jewish people from all over the world were gathered there for the festival of Pentecost. Many of them came to believe in Jesus. These new Christians were Jewish, but they had various first languages. Stephen is the first Christian leader that we meet who comes from one of these groups of Jewish people who have grown up outside of Palestine. His primary language was probably Greek, which made him seem second class to his Jewish relatives in Palestine. And so he shared the message of Jesus with other Greek-speaking Jews. He is eventually dragged into court for this, appearing before the Supreme Council of Jewish Leaders, 
the very same ones who had earlier conspired to have Jesus crucified. They accused Stephen of speaking against the traditions of their forefathers. Stephen stands alone, accused. His life hangs in the balance. So he appeals to the Jewish council on the basis of their own history. His words go on for 53 verses in Acts chapter 7. So I will summarize them briefly. He retells the story of the Jewish people, as recorded in their own scriptures. In doing so, he points out how God repeatedly sent his chosen leaders to deliver the Jewish people. But these chosen leaders were often rejected by their very own people. Joseph was rejected by his brothers, the fathers of the tribes of Israel. Although Moses was God's chosen leader, he too was rejected by his own people. And finally, Stephen reminds the Jewish council that they are responsible for crucifying Jesus for rejecting the Messiah promised by God. So after telling a very long story, Stephen gets to the point. Let's read the climax of Stephen's defense, starting in Acts 7, verse 51. Stephen said, You stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. This is the word of the Lord. Even though his life was on the line, Stephen had the guts, the courage, to hold the council responsible for the rejection and execution of Jesus. Stephen took a stand with Jesus, who had been executed because of this same council. One has to wonder, how did Stephen have the courage to do this? His courage came from his assurance that he did not really stand alone. In a very real way, Stephen stood with Jesus. Stephen stood with Jesus by being willing to suffer with Jesus. If you look closely at the Bible passage today, you will see that many of the descriptions of what Stephen faced were strikingly similar to what Jesus faced. Like Jesus, 
Stephen spoke the unpopular truth to his own people. Like Jesus, Stephen's words were then manipulated to create false charges against him. Like Jesus, Stephen was robbed of justice in court. Like Jesus, Stephen was finally sentenced because of an angry mob. Like Jesus, Stephen's dying request was to ask God to forgive those responsible for his death. Like Jesus, as Stephen died, he asked God to receive his spirit. The wording of these last prayers of Stephen are uncannily similar to Jesus' prayers on the cross. And yet they have one very important difference. Jesus' last words before his death were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Stephen puts Jesus in the place of God, one with the Father. Now that Jesus is risen and is enthroned at the right hand of the Father, he shares with the Father the final authority and care of each one of us as we pass through death into eternal life. In his final words, Stephen imitates Jesus, but he also affirms that Jesus is in the place of God. He is God the Son, at the right hand of the Father, whose spirit is ever with us. Stephen stood with Jesus in suffering like Jesus, but Stephen also stood with Jesus in how he viewed death. Stephen went to his death with his gaze upon Jesus, who had gone there before him. He looked past the rage of his enemies. He looked above the injustice of his situation. He looked beyond his isolation. He looked above and saw Jesus Christ, Son of God, exalted at the right hand of the Father. In fact, his gaze was so true that he was given a rare glimpse into heaven. While Stephen stood alone in court, he saw clear through to heaven. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. When Stephen was most isolated, most endangered, most vulnerable, he was given a special glimpse into heaven and saw Jesus there. He saw Jesus not as still crucified, but as now risen and exalted to the highest place. We also need a complete vision of Jesus, not only of Jesus as the infant of Christmas, not only of Jesus on the cross, not even only of Jesus risen from the dead, but also of Jesus ascended, ascended far above our earthly plane. Jesus exalted to the highest position of authority, power, and majesty. Jesus, one with the Father and the Spirit. When we face opposition and isolation, we need to fix our eyes upon the complete picture, upon the whole person of Jesus. I once heard a missionary describing the people he was trying to reach, he loved them and had, in a sense, become one of them. But he lamented their incomplete picture of Jesus. They had been raised with a form of Christian tradition that emphasized Christmas and Good Friday to the point that the only picture of Jesus that most of them had was of Jesus as either an infant or as a dying victim. They had little sense of a victorious God who could give them victory over sin and death and over every challenge that they faced. I wonder how much you and I have similar gaps in our picture of Christ. Stephen saw the complete picture of Christ. Stephen reminds us that Jesus is no longer on the cross. He is risen. And not only is he risen, he is ascended. And not only is he ascended, he is exalted. 
Today is actually known as Ascension Sunday on the traditional church calendar. Today should be a bigger celebration than Christmas. For Christ has ascended, victorious over our greatest enemies, over death, sin, and evil. Right now, Jesus sits enthroned at the right hand of the Father, supreme and sovereign over all history. That is why, when the Apostle John is given a vision into heaven, he also sees Jesus, described as a sacrificial lamb, but in a very specific location. John writes, Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. That is why the Apostle Paul writes, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Jesus is exalted to the highest place because he has died on our behalf and because he has risen, conquering death. When we face isolation and even opposition, We need to remember where Jesus is now, ascended, exalted to the highest position in all the universe. And from that all-powerful position, he is quick to help us, especially when we take a stand for him. Stephen stood with Jesus in his life, in his isolation, and even in his death. Stephen stood with Jesus, but even more, Jesus stood with Stephen. In most of the Bible's descriptions of the exalted Christ, we read of him being seated at the right hand of the Father. But here in Acts 7, we are told twice that Jesus is standing at the right hand of God. In the ancient world, it was often considered unbecoming for authorities to stand. They are generally described as being seated on their throne. So why is Jesus standing and not sitting? First, Jesus stands because he is Stephen's advocate in the heavenly court. Remember, Stephen is on trial in Jerusalem, where his earthly life is hanging in the balance. But Jesus stands in a much higher court, defending Stephen in the only courtroom that really counts. When others condemn us, Jesus stands as our advocate. Romans 8.34 encourages us. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. The exalted Christ stands in the court of heaven to defend all those who trust in him. Jesus stood as Stephen's advocate. Jesus also stood in order to welcome Stephen home. As Stephen approached his final moments on earth, he was given a rare glimpse into heaven. And then he saw where he was headed, and that none other than his Lord and advocate, Jesus, the Son of Man, was standing to welcome him home. And so Stephen breathed his last we read that he simply fell asleep. Death would be the darkest, most unrelenting form of isolation that we could ever face. But for those who entrust themselves to Jesus, it is merely a peaceful sleep, after which we soon awake, welcomed home by our Lord Jesus. That is why we cling to the promise of Psalm 23 as we face death. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Our dear elder brother, Dr. Bruce Milne, has commented about this verse that God does not forsake his servant as he approaches the valley of the shadow of death. God does not forsake us. Even in the most harrowing, isolating experience that a person can face, death itself, we are not alone. Jesus has walked that lonely valley before, and he will walk it there with us, welcoming us into the light of his eternal home. 
Jesus stands as our advocate. Jesus stands to welcome us home. I hope that you have entrusted your life to him. He invites us all to simply trust our life to him with all our future decisions and with all our past mistakes admitting our sins to him. Give it all to him. He offers a new life. He will walk with you by his spirit throughout this life and into the next. Please contact us at the church or talk to a Christian friend if you would like help with this. You may have noticed that the story of Stephen doesn't end with his death. It continues into the next chapter. The Christians are persecuted even more. But the result is that God moves them out, sharing the good news of Jesus wherever they go. Eventually, they will reach the ends of the earth with this message so that people everywhere can find eternal life in Jesus. And we also are part of that story, even now, in these times of a global pandemic. Even now, God is moving people to communicate in new places and in new ways so that many more people can discover his saving grace. The Holy Spirit is still at work. Jesus is still exalted at the right hand of God. He ascended there in order to send us his Spirit so that we can have his power to share him and to stand for him in whatever we face. Whether it is isolation, sickness, employment, I mean unemployment, or overemployment, anxiety, or opposition. Whatever we face, Jesus stands with us as our advocate. His Spirit gives us strength to stand for him. And Jesus, the Son of Man and the Son of God, will stand with us to the end until the day he welcomes us into his home. As we head into a new week, let's go knowing that the one who goes with us has ascended to the place of highest power and authority, and he is on our side. Let's remember the last words he spoke on earth before he ascended to heaven. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Go then in the power of the Holy Spirit, knowing that our ascended Lord stands with you. Amen.